Uh, let's talk about how these bankruptcies uh, can ultimately end up weighing on the financials. Lisa Donahue of Alex, Alex Partners Global uh, joining us now. Uh, she's the global head of turnaround and restructuring services. Uh, I just want to pick up on, on kind of what Scarlett was saying in terms of the numbers and where we're going. What is your sense of how far through this process we are? What do you think uh, the final numbers ultimately end up looking like, uh, look like uh, in terms of U.S. bankruptcies? Good morning, Alex and Guy, and thank you um, for having me. You know, I, I think we've got a long way to go. Um, when you think about the the bank balance sheets, I think what it really comes down to is what their exposures are to certain industries, which you've been talking about all morning, retail, oil and gas, consumer-facing, energy, power, things like that, and what their non-performing loans look like. One thing we have been seeing, which has been great, is the capital markets have been very flexible for companies and have allowed them to refinance, to raise capital in order to give them time and a runway to see if they can, you know, outrun this pandemic. But I don't think we've hit bottom yet. I think that this is going to be a protracted period where we're going to be looking at lots of companies needing um, restructuring, needing support, possibly needing a bankruptcy in order to get rid of some unprofitable contracts or to resize their businesses. So when do we see the peak? Um, the CEO of Deutsche Bank told Bloomberg this week he sees the bad loans hitting a peak in the second quarter. When do the bankruptcies hit their peak? You know, um, the bankruptcies, if, if I think it would be helpful to think about what we were seeing before COVID hit. And what we were seeing was um, disruption leading to a lot of bankruptcies and a lot of underperforming companies. So even before you add on a global pandemic, which is challenging operationally for even the most well-run companies and companies with the strongest balance sheets, we were seeing disruption and um, some challenges with retail oil and gas and other companies. And then you add on a um, shutdown, even though it wasn't a pure shutdown um, in the U.S. as it was in Europe. But what we did have is um, a lot of consumers pulling back and we had manufacturing plants shut down. So I don't think that second quarter um, is is the end of it for bankruptcies. And I think it's going to be directly linked to how long the the virus and some you know select shutdowns and um, select concern on consumer part is going to drive, particularly when you think about airlines, um, hotels, movie theaters car rental, all of those types of consumer-driven businesses that rely on people moving. And as long as people aren't moving, I think it's going to be a challenge. Lisa, how straightforward are many of these bankruptcies going to be? Are there any bottlenecks in the system that could potentially slow them down? And are there assets in these businesses do you think that other people are going to want? Um, that, you know, that's a good question. I think depending on the business, there will certainly be opportunities for some of these businesses that maybe were thinking about getting rid of non-core assets. This could be an opportunity for them to get back to basics, to focus on core operations and to see if certain assets would perform better with a, with a different owner. Um, as far as bottlenecks, I, you know, I, I don't really see um, bottlenecks. I think that it's more about well planning and thinking about when you enter into a bankruptcy, you really do want to think about what you want to look like coming out if, if you have the luxury of planning versus kind of a, a very fast bankruptcy that you have to do to protect the assets. So I don't see a bottleneck, but I do think that it um, is an opportunity for companies, particularly if they find themselves in that situation, to do as much as they can operationally to improve the operations while they're in there. So are we going to be in a situation, though, at some point where banks are going to own assets they don't care about or don't want to operate? And I, I'm specifically thinking about, say, oil and gas. I mean, it's up to banks obviously are going to want to renegotiate the loans as much as they can so to keep the company afloat. But at some point, are they going to wind up owning like an oil asset and have no idea kind of what to do with it? Is this kind of where we're going? 
Um, you know, there, there are situations where um, the creditors do end up owning assets. And what will typically happen is they will install management teams. So although they may have an ownership stake, the operations would be put in the hands of folks that do know how to operate them. I'm sitting here in London. I'm curious as to what the differences are going to be in terms of this process across the Atlantic. I, how does the US compare with Germany, France, the UK? Uh, are there differences in the model that are going to have an impact ultimately on the way that economies recover? Because as you say, we're going to see a significant number of bankruptcies and everybody's trying to figure out how to, how to get these assets to work best, uh, how we keep some of these companies alive. Uh, are there significant differences around the world in terms of the way that the process is going to work? Well, there are significant differences around the world. I think that um, certain countries have adopted a bankruptcy-like regime, which is, you know, reorganization and um, rehabilitation. So you take the time when you're in a U.S. Chapter 11 to fix the operations and to right-size the balance sheet and to, um, you know, fix the companies. And there are instances across the world where those types of regimes do also allow you to do that. I'm thinking about, you know, a London scheme of arrangement or a U.K. scheme of arrangement and some of the Commonwealth countries and the way that they think about um, rehabilitation and 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 fixing companies. So it's important when you're thinking about a multinational to be really strategic about how and where you file, how you plan, and what again what you accomplish while you're in there. That's that's hugely important. So I guess it's a question uh, cross border and sort of what's the pain threshold uh, for banks, whether you're a European bank uh, or a U.S. bank? How much can they tolerate before? the weight of any bankruptcies is, is, is just too much and they have to really rethink some things. Well, I, I think um, institutionally, every bank organization is going to have their own thresholds and they're going to have their own approach to what their um, their capital and what their balance sheets can take. And, you know, they have the option to do a couple of things. They can um, continue to support the credit and do what we call amend and extend, meaning taking a look at their exposure and taking a look at the loan and seeing how much longer they can, um, you know, extend covenants, extend maturities, extend, um, you know, all sorts of things like that. And then they can also um, sell the loan in the secondary market, which happens a lot. And you have secondary buyers that buy it for whatever percentage it's trading at. And that's how, um, in my experience, is the banks, you know, manage their gap and they manage, you know, how much tolerance they have for risk. And again, I think it comes down to what industries they're exposed to and what their own institutional tolerance is. Really interesting. It's me fascinating to hear about this uh, on Banks Calls as well. Lisa, thank you very much. Uh, Lisa Donahue, Alex Partners, a global head of turnaround and restructuring services.